Hey, Jesse, when you're ready. All right, welcome. Over the next few days, uh, as a class, we shall be examining a number of communication measurement devices. Today, I am here to describe one such device, and that is compliance scanning techniques uh, formulated in 1967 uh, by two sociologists, Gerard uh, Marwell and David R. Schmidt. Um, although there have been a variety of alterations to this device over the years, I'll be examining how uh, Marwell and Schmidt uh, originally uh, utilized their device. So let's get to it. Um, first, I will describe the measurement device. Second, I will explain what it is used for. Third, I will explain how to use um, how to use it, and lastly, I will explain how it can be used in a hypothetical experiment. Uh, now that I have addressed what we will be covering, I'll now turn to our, my, our device. Um, to distinguish a set of dimensions of compliance gaining behavior, Marwell and Schmidt constructed a questionnaire designed to elicit the response the likelihood of performing various types of techniques in different situations. That's Rebecca B. Rubin, um, who's discussing essentially, uh, is one of the people who analyzed this device that I used. Um, there are 16 types of compliance gaining techniques in this method that can be thought of as frames that are put forth in four hypothetical situations. For example, four situations could fall under the umbrella of job, family, sales, roommates. Then each situation makes statements pertaining to the 16 compliance gaining techniques that are as follows. One, promise. Two, threat. Three, positive expertise. Four, negative expertise. Five, liking. Six, pre-giving. Seven, aversive simulation. Eight, debt. Nine, moral appeal. Ten, positive self-feeling. Let's see. Uh, Eleven, negative self-feeling. Twelve, positive alter casting. And thirteen, negative alter casting. And alter casting is where you, if you want someone to be a certain way, you put them in a role. Like you say, well, well good students do this. If you're trying to get your student to be more, uh, you know, scholastic, you put them in that role instead of being like, you should be like this, say, you know, these are the type, and you put them into the role that you want them. Um, 14 is altruism, 15 is positive esteem, and 16 is negative esteem. All in all, the subjects are given four hypothetical situations with thick 16 statements and are asked to rank them using a Likert type scale, ranging from extremely likely to extremely unlikely, with one being the most likely and eight being the least likely. The subjects then have four minutes on each situation. In total, four situations times 16 statements. Each subject is asked to respond to 64 statements. These 16 statements are then clustered into five categories. The five categories are rewarding activity, punishing activity, expertise, activation of impersonal commitments, and then activation of personal commitments. The results are summed into ordinal data, data that is further broken down into subjects willing to engage in more socially acceptable techniques and those that are willing to engage in unacceptable techniques. Now that I have described the device, let's look at what it's used for. It is clear that people spend a good deal of time trying to get others to act in ways they desire. It is equally clear that people vary in the ways they go about attempting such interpersonal control. Yet students of social control have only recently begun to explore these variations. Most research has concentrated on why people comply rather than how they go about gaining compliance. So essentially, they're doing the reverse, where so many people were like, uh, how do we go about, um, how do people get persuaded? Now this is flipping it into uh, how do we do the persuasion. Um, as the name implies, the device is used to measure what techniques uh, subjects use to gain compliance. Now that you know what it's used for, I'll explain I will explain how to use it. Uh, you create four situations, apply the 16 techniques, cluster into five categories, summed and transformed into ordinal data, and analyze for subjects' uh, willingness to engage in more socially acceptable techniques and those who are willing to engage in unacceptable techniques. Now that you know how to use this device, I will now walk you through a hypothetical use of it. In this experiment, I shall be using 420 HSU students who have been randomly selected this device is considered descriptive research and cannot be generalized to a greater population. Therefore, there's no population, variable, or hypothesis. Therefore, all 420 students are in the experimental group. For the sake of time, I shall be using one situation, that of education, and eight out of my 16 compliance gaining techniques. 
Situation A, education. The president of your university continually disregards the input and wishes of the majority of your students, faculty, and staff. You want him to foster a more participatory decision-making process. One, promise if you comply, I will reward you. You let your president know that by doing so, he will have the support of students, faculty, and staff. Then you circle, which, how likely are you? You can say, oh, I'm extremely likely to use that um, method. Two, threat. If you do not comply, I will punish you. You threaten to have associated students vote no confidence and have the faculty to do it as well, again. Um, three, pre-giving. Act rewards target for being target before requesting compliance. You send messages of support to the president's office. Then you, again, just circle, extremely likely. And that will go throughout, so I'm not going to say it over and over again, but you just circle. I'm extremely likely to do that. I'm extremely unlikely to do that. Um, four is aversive stimulation, where the actor continuously punishes the target, making cessation on compliance. You, if for example, you throw a rally every day outside his office, write weekly letters to the newspaper, telephone tag his office, and speak at every associated student meeting, speak with student representatives during their office hours. And also, I probably didn't make clear, uh, essentially, this right here, these statements are the actual compliance gaining techniques, so three, four, as you go down. And then the actual like words are what you create for your own situation that falls under that category. Next, debt. You owe me compliance because of past favors. You point out that pre the president wouldn't make twice as much money as the governor of the state of California, along with a paid for house, spending allowance, personal car, major benefits package, etc., without the faculty, students, and staff to administer to. Six, a moral appeal. You are immoral if you do not comply. You tell the president that it is morally wrong to let a handful of administrators decide the fate of so many without your input. Seven, positive altar casting. A person with good qualities would comply. You tell the president that anyone who is socially conscious would naturally want to comply. And eight, altar casting. A person with bad qualities would not comply. You tell the president that only someone who is tyrannical would not comply. You then cluster that data, sum it into ordinal data, Break it down into subjects willing to engage in more socially acceptable te techniques and those who are willing to engage in unacceptable techniques. Now that you know what the measurement device, compliance gaining technique is, what it is used for, how to use it, and have seen it in a hypothetical experiment, you too can use this method to see how people go about attempting gaining compliance. Thank you.